So thank you for being here. Welcome to the online community that joins us. So we appreciate all of your presence. Have you enjoyed Leviticus? Is that the right verb to use, Leviticus being enjoyed? I'm not sure. It's one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, uh, books in the Bible to understand, but there is God's purpose behind his words in his word. We're going to look today at Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Uh, before we get there, let me give you a brief overview in case you're just joining us of what we've covered so far. God entered into a covenant relationship with Israel, and at Sinai, he gave them laws that they needed to obey in order to keep that relationship intact. But God knew that we're sinful people, and in our sinfulness, we had to answer this most difficult question from him. How can you, a sinful humanity, come into my presence as a sinless holy God? There has to be forgiveness to take place. So God gave the book of Leviticus, gave the Levitical holiness laws for ways for our sins to be forgiven. Chapters 1 through 7 that we've covered, God gave five different uh, sacrifices that needed to take place regularly by the Jewish people. Uh, these animals that were offered in these sacrifices served as substitutionary atonements for the people's sin. The animal's blood in substitution for the people's blood because our sin in the sight of God is a capital offense. It deserves death. So there's a substitution of death on the animal's behalf instead of us. Again, five different sacrifices given in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. Then Leviticus 8 through 10 are God's specific instructions to the priests on how to carry out all of these animal sacrifices so the people's sins can be forgiven and they can come into his presence in the tent of meeting in the sanctuary to be able to worship him. Then we saw a couple of weeks ago, Le Leviticus 11, are the kosher laws, the dietary laws. And in those, God's trying to tell the Israelites, in the midst of these godless Canaanites who live around them, there are certain foods that are clean and certain foods that are unclean. And I think arbitrarily, God chose the ones that are clean and the ones that are unclean so that three times a day when the Jews ate, they would remember in their minds they are to be a clean people. A holy people, Leviticus 19.2, God said, be holy as I am holy. And every single meal with what they ate, they were reminded that they were to be a clean, holy people and not to be an unclean, unholy people. So then we move into today's text, Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and the child purification laws. What a woman, a mom, had to go through after having given birth to a child. A perfect afterthought to Mother's Day, wouldn't you say? So if you're ready, I think I am, out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, let us go hear the word of the Lord. Would you please stand? Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 8, this is the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary, until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her menstruation." And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. And some of you right now are going, huh? 
<laughs> what in the world? Believe me, friends, there's truth in God's word. It's here for a purpose. There's something underlying these words that I just read to you. Let's get at them today. First of all, look at the first division. It is the Lord's instruction to Moses in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, you got to notice that the Lord is the one who spoke these words to Moses and he wrote them down. If that's true, that means that God is the author of the book of Leviticus. The Lord's the one who spoke it. In fact, the Lord is the one who spoke to all of his prophets through the ages to write this book. Here's my point. If this book is not divinely authored by God himself, why in the world are we here? Why should we gather together every week and come together even for one more moment? But we believe as Christians that God authored this book. It's divinely inspired. And it has not only changed our lives by reading it and believing it, it has caused the church to be what it is in the people of God coming together. So the first point is God is the one who authored this book. And therefore, if it's in Leviticus, it has a reason for being in the Bible. There's something God's trying to teach us in every portion of the Scripture, including Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. So let's look at the next division to begin to get at what those reasons may be. There is secondly a period of uncleanness after childbirth for women. That's verses 2 through 5. The woman is trying to avoid an unclean state after a, her menstruation, her monthly cycle, but also in the delivery of a child. For those of you women who have delivered children, you know you lose a great deal of blood. And here's the principle. Blood outside the body for God is considered unclean. Not only is it a potential contagion, but it's also simply something that attracts all kinds of flies and, and other insects that you know of. So we have for moms this calling from God to keep a consecrated time period for the birth of a boy and the birth of a girl. Now, first of all, looking at the birth of the boy. After he is born, the, the mom's to take a purification time period. It lasts for 40 days altogether. After the seventh day, on the eighth day, the male child is brought to the priest and that child is circumcised. Now, for those of you who don't understand the place of circumcision in the Bible, let me give it to you very quickly. When God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, present-day Iran, to leave that nation and go to a place where he didn't know where he was going, it was ultimately Canaan, the new promised land, today's Israel, God said to him in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham, and I'm authoring it. And my covenant is simply this. I shall be your God and you shall be my people. And I will write my laws on your heart. And then you will go in this promised land and through you I will provide a son. And this son will bless every nation on the face of the earth. Now God gave that promise to Abraham when he was 75 and Sarah was 65. At that point beginning to be past the years of childbearing. But interestingly, the promise wasn't fulfilled until Genesis 17 when God finally, at the age of 100 for Abraham and at the age of 90 for Sarah, gave them a son by the name of Isaac. And on the eighth day after his birth, God commanded Abraham to circumcise Isaac. Now, during that circumcision ceremony, the foreskin of the male instrument is cut away. It is a symbolic spiritual gesture saying to God's covenant people and every male thereafter, but for females too, when you enter into faith in me, you are to cut away the foreskin, the flesh of your life. Now, flesh in the Bible is always symbolic of our old sinful natures, our selfish reasons for living. So when we enter into covenant with God, circumcision is a spiritual symbol of cutting away all of that selfishness, getting rid of it so that we can enter into that new, intimate, personal relationship with the living God. 
Every male thereafter on the eighth day had to be circumcised every time he looked at his instrument as an outward sign of the inward reality that the flesh, his selfish nature, had been cut away and now he was to live in a relationship with God and God alone as his primary priority. So here we have the woman after childbirth on the eighth day presenting her male son for circumcision. Then the other 33 days afterwards, up to 40 days, she is to spend that time still doing domestic duties but contemplating what this particular child may mean. We'll come back to that in just a moment. If it's a female child, though, she's supposed to stay in that state of purification not 40 days but 80 days. Many people throughout the ages have asked the question, why does the female child demand twice as long in the purification process as the male? All kinds of different answers have been given. Let me present to you some of them. First of all, some have suggested in that day, women simply were not as valuable as men. So therefore, there needed to be twice as long as a forgiveness time period for a female baby as a male baby. But this makes no sense. Because amidst the Canaanite culture, the godless pagans that existed in that day, God planted a holy people. And if you read many of the holiness laws in and outside Leviticus, you'll find that comparatively, women for the Jewish tradition were treated in extraordinarily positive ways. You see in creation, for example, Eve was created from Adam's side, not from under his feet. She was an equal partner in the relationship. Moreover, if you read more closely many of the laws given by God to Moses, women were allowed to own property. Again, comparatively to the other Canaanite cultures around them, women were exalted among the Jews. So that explanation really makes no sense. Some have suggested that in that day it was believed that female children uh, caused two times the childbearing pain for the woman. And also the woman lost two times more blood therefore demanding two times more of a purification process. The problem with that explanation is we know um, medically today that's simply not true. That's not what happens with female babies as compared to male babies. Thirdly, some have thought that this is a symbolic gesture on the count of God, knowing that as the mom cares for this female child over 80 days, it's symbolic of the reality that girl babies that grow up will have a monthly cycle and will continue to lose blood. And they'll also go through child delivery themselves, which will allow their bodies to lose a lot of blood. So therefore, it's looking forward to all the blood they'll use. Um, That could be it. It makes some sense, but nobody really understands that totally and completely. Uh, Fourth, and, and this is probably the best explanation, nobody knows. Nobody really knows. Now, let me offer you, in an attempt to seem like I'm smarter than I really am, the Chadwickian idea. Now, before I give it to you, you need to understand this is totally Chadwickian and not Bible. But here's one guess that I might give to why this may occur. Last week on Mother's Day, had I been here, I would have preached this message to you. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Isn't it true? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. If you've got a mother praying for you right now and you're wayward, running away from faith, whatever, you might as well give up and answer her prayers because you're going to lose. You're toast if your mama's praying for you in the name of Jesus. So women have an extraordinary power, mothers especially. So Maybe, just maybe, the moms practicing with the 80 days as opposed to 40 for the male child with the girl, attachment parenting. Marilyn and I, with all three of our children, practiced attachment parenting. There's some debate about that. We get that. But it's something we felt called to do. Attachment parenting means basically from day one. That child is on the breast. Marilyn nursed our children for a couple of years. We put them in the bed with us. I would stroke that little baby from day one. When Bethany, our first child, our daughter was born, I held her close to me from day one. And my belief was I want her to feel my touch every single day so she won't long for Boomer's touch when she's a teenager. 
And we feel like that made a difference in the amount of time we spent with them, cuddling them, caring for them, and loving them. Now, if that's true, maybe God gave the mother 80 days instead of 40 with the hands that would rock the cradle in the years to come. That attachment parenting helped prepare that daughter to be the significant mother later on who would continue to be God's blessing to the covenant community of faith. That's Chadwickian. It's not Bible necessarily, but it does make some sense, at least from our experience. The final section is a return to full participation in the community of faith by the woman after either the 40 or the 80 days of purification. That's verses 6 through 8. Uh, she would then come to the tent of the meeting and would offer a lamb a year old for a burnt offering or a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. She, the mom would make two offerings. One was a burnt offering. The second was a sin offering. Now, it's interesting that after uh, that's done, the priest would declare the mom purified and the mom would be welcomed back into the assembly, into the worship time period, and could then eat of the consecrated meals outlined in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. What's also fascinating here, though, is the people who could not afford a lamb, the poorer people of the day. Folks, there have always been different socioeconomic strata in every culture that's ever existed. So God wants to make sure in his economy that mothers who are poor, who don't have a lamb, can also offer a burnt and sin offering to be included and welcomed back and restored to the community of faith. So you see in verse 8 that if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement, declare that the sins have been covered and the person's now restored as forgiven in the sight of God. Now what's especially fascinating for me for those of you who know your Bibles, you know that when Jesus was born, on the eighth day in Luke, the second chapter, Mary presented Jesus to be circumcised under the law, doing everything the law required. And then she went into the 33 days of purification. And then if you continue to read in Luke, the second chapter, she then brings Jesus to the priest. He asks for his name. She says his name is Jesus. And then she offers what kind of offering? Do any of you remember? Two turtle doves. Two turtle doves. She and Joseph could not afford a lamb. They were poor. And when I realize this, I can't help but think of us as parents and, and how many of us think that the way to our kids' hearts is by buying them presents, stuff? And then I think of God the Father and his son Jesus entrusting them to two human parents. And what he gave them, gave his son most, was not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E he gave them parents and their P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, their presents. That God knew the most valuable possession a parent can give a child is themselves. Kids spell love, T-I-M-E. It's a lesson for all of us. In God's economy, the greatest gift we can give our kids is our time, our presence, ourselves. And, and so now the woman is fully restored to the community of faith. We in our day have as kind of a circumcision, baby dedication. So if you have a child, you need to present that child to the Lord in front of the congregation. It's our way of expressing this same idea. So as you look at this, the question then becomes, well, what's God trying to teach us? What's underneath all of this? And I'd like to suggest to you there are four decided principles that God's trying to teach us in this woman's purification time period that he intently set aside. 
First of all, during the 40 days for the male and the 80 days for the female, I think God is trying to show the mom during this time period when she has lots of time to think and reflect with this child in her arms about the reality of original sin in her baby. Now, you need to know that babies are a gift from God. They're beautiful, they're wondrous, and when that little baby is put in your arms for the first time, that bundle of joy, you also need to know it's a bundle of joyous original sin. And if you don't believe that child is filled with selfishness, then have a child. They want the world to revolve around them, and parents see it from day one. When that sinful fallen sperm connects with a sinful fallen ovum, it produces a sinful fallen child. It's again called the doctrine of original sin. Many people find it offensive, but it is taught throughout the scripture. Particularly in the fall, in Genesis 3, when the woman with Adam rebelled against God, here is the curse that's placed upon her. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between the evil one, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. There will be immediate enmity between every child born and the evil one who will want to kill, steal, and destroy that child. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Then verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. There'll be three curses placed on women because of the fall. First, they'll try to dominate men and not allow them to be the spiritual leaders God called them to be in the relationship of marriage. Secondly, the curse will be her desire shall be for her husband. Too many women will try to find their identity in a man rather than a relationship with God. And third and finally, in childbearing, when those contractions start occurring and the pain gets greater and greater, it is a reminder with each contraction that was not a part of God's original design. He did not intend that kind of pain to be a part of childbearing. And with each contraction, it will remind the woman that that child is a part of original sin, is a part of the fall, and that child has been conceived as a selfish human being. During those purification days, the mama has a chance as she's holding that baby to say, you're beautiful, you're a gift from God. Children are a gift from God, but you're also filled with original sin. Therefore, I'm going to use these days to think thoroughly through how to follow through with Proverbs 22, 7, which says, raise up a child in the ways of the Lord and he'll never depart from them. How can I work to make sure I change this bentness toward self to a bentness toward God? Every time she remembers each contraction, she remembers this child, though beautiful and joyous, is filled with self, and I need to figure out ways to move that bentness toward God and not self. Those 40 and 80 days give her the chance to do so. In our Christian faith, though, we believe that when you're born of the Holy Spirit, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a new nature. That bentness is changed toward God. And Marilyn and I, with our three children, believed that we wanted to bring them to faith in Jesus as early as possible. We believed every study that we read showed that children can come to a genuine understanding of who Jesus is between the ages of five and seven. So Marilyn thought through greatly how she might have opportunities to share Jesus with the children. The one place she finally decided where she would always have a chance to share the risen Lord with our children was in her van while she drove them around. They were a captive audience, to say the least. And she would try to initiate and engage conversations with the children regarding their sinful condition, regarding the Savior Jesus. And she brought all three of our children to faith in Jesus while driving around in a van. We call it evangelism. (laughs) Bad joke, but you get the point. But Marilyn carefully thought through when those children were babies when she would have those opportunities to bring them to faith. 
Every woman in here, when you have a child, you should use opportunities when you are alone to think through, how am I going to bring that child to faith in the living Lord Jesus Christ? You see, Marilyn and I both never wanted our three children to have Huge testimonies of how they used to walk in darkness, used to walk in pornography, used to walk in alcohol, used to walk in other addictions, and now they're free in Jesus. We didn't want that kind of testimony. We wanted their testimony basically to be, we came to faith in Jesus at an early age, and we lived for him all of our years. We didn't want them to have the deep scars of pain, of rebellion on their hearts, and then later come to faith in Jesus. Now, certainly that can happen, and for many of you it has happened, praise God. But we just didn't want that for our children. And we thought, as we read these passages, that this purification time allows a mom to think through how to bring their kids to faith at the earliest possible age. Secondly, this purification time period is an opportunity for the mom to realize that This life is about life and not death. During those 40 or 80 days, the mom gets to think about the bleeding that took place and how that bleeding in God's sight is unclean. Now, now the birth itself is not unclean, but the bleeding is, and the woman has the chance to remember that blood outside the body is unclean from God's perspective. Blood inside the body is clean from God's perspective. During this time period, 40 days for a male baby and 80 days for a female baby, the mama has the chance while holding that child to consider how to bring life to this child and to the covenant community of faith. She has the chance to think through, like I hope many of you moms do, asking the question, how can I help bring life to this world? How can I give life to little babies, not only in the womb, but outside the womb? How can I bring life to the poor, the oppressed, the impoverished, and the disenfranchised? Because God is about life, not death. And this time period of reflection gives the mom a chance to think about how to live her life to give life to other people. Third, this time period gives the mom a chance to constantly discern what's clean and what's unclean. We've already covered that in her diet... And her family's diet, three times a day, she has food declared by God that's clean and food that's declared unclean. So three times a day, she has to think through, I am a holy person called by God in covenant community at Mount Sinai to be set apart, to be holy as he's holy. Moreover, though, the mom, not just with food, gets to to think through everything in life that's considered unclean by God. You'll see in the next several weeks, we're going to look at leprosy and discharges and fungi and things like that that God calls unclean. But it's even beyond that, folks. This time period gives moms a chance to think through anything that's unclean that she doesn't want in her home. For us today, that is moms who see themselves as gatekeepers in their homes. And you're very much invested in knowing what your children watch on television the movies they go to, the friends they hang out with, what's going on in their computer world, and you're not allowing that kind of uncleanness to come into your house. But that takes some serious time of reflection to figure out what's unclean so you don't allow it into your home. Do you moms see yourselves as gatekeepers of purity, as gatekeepers of uncleanliness, in your home. And and by the way, dads, you should be a part of that too. Guardians of purity in your homes. I think this time period gave moms the chance to think through that. And fourth, it also gave moms a chance to think through the majestic grace and forgiveness of God. During their times of uncleanness, they thought of their sin. They thought of original sin. But then they also thought about how God provided a lamb, turtle doves, pigeons, whatever it might be, in order for atonement to occur. They had the chance to think about how loving God is because he wants to restore every single broken 
person in the covenant community of faith. Do, do you hear the significance of that today, folks? Let me give it to you in case you don't understand. I don't care how broken you may feel today. I don't care how sinful your heart may feel today. I don't care what you think you've ever done is beyond the grace, mercy, and kindness of God. It's not. It's not. The whole goal of this purification process was to restore the woman to the community of faith and worship of a holy God. It was to restore her to all of the covenant meals offered in the community of faith. It was to allow her in the sin offering and the burnt offering to first of all know that in the burnt offering she's totally devoted by God or to God and knows his great joy. In the sin offering she's received his forgiveness and she's now restored. I don't care what you've ever done. Your sin is not beyond the grace of God. Let me say it again. Your sin is not beyond the grace of God. Whatever you've done, he wants to restore you to himself and to his community of faith. Do you believe that today? If so, give God praise. It's so true. The character of God is beyond anything we could possibly ever hope for or imagine. He loves you so much, and he wants to restore your life to him. Your sin's not greater than his love. Believe it today. Please believe it today. One final thought. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, we read these words. In him, in Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The actual physical circumcision for Christians today is your choice. It has nothing to do with biblical faithfulness or not. But what should not be your choice is coming to faith in Jesus and giving your life to him and having your heart circumcised. As in the physical understanding of circumcision in the Old Testament where the foreskin is cut away, symbolizing the flesh of that person being cut away and now living for God. Similarly, in our hearts, when you come to faith in Jesus, he cuts away the foreskin, the flesh, that selfish nature that has previously guided you. And he cuts it away and sets it aside and gives you now a clean, pure, perfect, forgiven, restored heart. As I've said so often, the heart of the matter is what, folks? matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. God wants to deal with your heart more than anything else. He gets your heart. He gets the rest of your life. And what God does in Jesus is he performs a circumcision of the heart. He cuts away the foreskin of your heart. And all that unholiness is cut away so that your pure heart is in relationship with God and with one another. Be holy as I am holy. The word of the Lord.